This next segment, uh, as you heard from Dr. Fan, uh, there's a lot of progress, uh, a lot of clinical progress. I loved her slide showing uh, all the different things that have happened over the decades that have allowed us to introduce new treatments in particular and what each of them has done in terms of layering on not only new results in terms of overall survival, but new layers of choices, options that you and your doctors working together now have. You're going to hear a little bit more about some of those in terms of imaging in this segment. Um, you're also going to hear about a different kind of progress, the progress in terms of research. Uh, and I couldn't be more excited about this. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the executive director of the Caring for Carcinoid uh, Foundation. Just a couple of slides to sort of go back through that. So the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, started by a patient, a patient who was misdiagnosed repeatedly by her doctors, and when finally diagnosed, uh, had metastatic uh, disease not only in her, um, uh, uh, in her liver, but also in her bones, et cetera, and uh, was given uh, just a few months to live, basically. Um, the, the diagnosis was wrong. Uh, she had a carcinoid tumor, uh, metastatically involved, of course, but when she looked for information about research that was going on, there was very little, for virtually no public funding uh, for uh, research in this rare disease space of cancer. Uh, and so she set about, um, with a small board and a scientific advisory uh, board, uh, to change that. Um, and so our core mission is really about finding ways to produce, uh, through research, better treatments, uh, as well as eventually cures for all forms of uh, neuroendocrine tumors, not just carcinoid, pancreatic, et cetera. Um, to date, now we have, uh, we're approaching our 10th anniversary next year. Uh, we've awarded over $10 million of research, and these, these grants go to uh, organizations, research labs, and major cancer centers. Seven of the top 10 cancer centers are uh, contracting with Caring for Carcinoid. Um, uh, amazing oversight by our Board of Scientific Advisors, These, uh, some of the most world-renowned scientists who are giving of their time on a volunteer basis to make sure that everything we do is peer-reviewed and vetted, and not only we do that ourselves, we also collaborate with the largest international uh, neuroendocrine uh, cancer research organization, the American Association for Cancer Research, 37,000 cancer researchers from all over the world, and we also contract through them to get the best ideas every year that are out there, do their own peer review, and make sure that we can fund projects that have perhaps new and, and innovative ideas that we wouldn't have thought about even with the amazing scientists that are at our table. Uh, we are also, as you know, support, uh, committed to supporting patients and families through these educational programs and through a website that provides, I know so many of you have already told me, uh, we, we trust as much of, of the most valid and, and clear information as we possibly can uh, make available to patients. So we'll talk more about that. And we are launching a very exciting immunotherapy initiative that we talked a little bit about here last year, for those of you who are here, and I can uh, fill in some of those details as we go through. But let me just tell you a little bit about our strategy next. This is really a comprehensive and integrated strategy to get to the bottom of what it is that make these tumors form, grow, change, and how we can stop those processes and eventually how we can eliminate those tumors. And there's really three levels of this when you think about it. There's the basic science level where we're really doing some of the only uh, uh, epigenetic and now uh, whole genome sequencing of these tumors to try to find out what are the mutations, what's the biology, What's, what are the drivers on a molecular level that cause these tumors to form in the first place and cause them to grow and change? Critical foundation for any sustained uh, research uh, function. Um, very importantly, then, we have to develop models. We have to be able to, as many other cancers can, grow these cancers, if you will, in the laboratory, in petri dishes and cell lines, they call them, colonies of those cells or in laboratory animals, et cetera. Very daunting task in our field for some reason. Well, one of the reasons, as Dr. Pham said, is they're often slow-growing tumors. They're very difficult to reproduce 
uh, in the laboratory. So we have some mouse models and others, but what's so important about this is we want to be able to test a whole variety of treatments and drugs safely without subjecting our patients to undue risk. So this, as some of you have heard who've been involved with us, is a daunting task, but one we're trying everything to solve. We're offering international prizes now. Anybody in the world who can come up with a reliable, that we can validate test for pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine cancer, carcinoid cancer, we'll, we have two sets of prizes that are available. And the good news is we've got candidates coming in from all over the world now too. So very important innovation to try to develop those models because the ultimate goal is to really get to clinical and preclinical trials of new treatments that really have the potential not only for improving progression free, free survival or overall survival, but for really curing this disease. And that's, that's what we're really uh, ultimately about in terms of our mission. Uh, that kind of a strategy and bringing the, uh, the best investigators, the best minds, uh, not only in neuroendocrine cancer research, but in cancer research globally. Um, and, and so through some of the earlier discoveries, for instance, we've led to um, in, uh, uh, insights about our tumors that have also led other cancer researchers to uh, have some new clues to opening doors to new lines of inquiry that can solve why these tumors grow and how to stop them. So we've been attracting cancer experts and brilliant young investigators to our cause, just awarded another brilliant young investigator uh, award, uh, and working as much as we can with other foundations. There are some family foundations where someone's been affected by these uh, these cancers that we're also working very closely with. You heard last year, the year before, about the Gold Hershey Allen Foundation right here in Los Angeles. Uh, very important that if there are multiple research things going out, that, out there, that we are collaborating with them to make sure that we are bringing the best minds and the most rapid progress to our, our challenge. And all of that is peer-reviewed that we fund by our scientific advisors or by the AACR. Uh, and the goal uh, to get to our mission accomplishment is really to grow and sustain a c community, an international community of researchers that are dedicated and committed to staying with the research to find a cure and better treatments for neuroendocrine cancers. Very exciting work. There's been a lot of progress over the last several years, so starting with some breakthroughs at Johns Hopkins in 2011 that gave us some of the first mutations in our cancers that we were able to start to fund other labs, bring them in to look to see what that might mean for treatment down the road, et cetera. Here I'm just displaying that last bucket, the one that's translational, which is usually of most interest to our patients. Um, and here you can see that, um, and some of these, by the way, are institutions uh, uh, like uh, University of California, San Francisco, Dr. German, uh, Dr. Chen at University of Wisconsin, Di uh, Diane Reedy at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, as is Wolfgang Weber. That's our first clinical trial that will be starting up very soon in terms of a new form of PRRT you'll hear more about in a moment. But all of these other projects are really about immunotherapy. This is something that is taking the entire cancer world by storm. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about that because we have five different projects now that have been funded at Stanford, at University of Pennsylvania, you'll hear more about those in a second, but also at Dana-Farber Cancer Center and in London to really help us make sure that we take advantage of the best minds in these fields and the ones that are finding breakthroughs in other cancers and enlist them in our, in our mission for cures for neuroendocrine. So I'm gonna talk now about immunotherapy, which is the most exciting thing that we have going uh, really in the cancer world. This is the cover of Science Magazine from just a year ago declaring cancer immunotherapy as the breakthrough of the year. And I just came uh, just several weeks ago from the American Society for Clinical Oncology meetings in Chicago, 33,000 uh, attendees at this meeting, and you could not get into the sessions. When I talk about getting in, I'm talking about a conference room that had 10,000 seats in it. You could not get in. It was standing room only for all of the immunotherapy sessions. That's how this is transforming the way we're thinking about cancer and cancer treatment uh, in the future. And without going into all the details, there are really three different forms of immunotherapy that people are talking about. You're going to hear about two of them today because we're investing in these two. One is the actual 
killing of cancer cells, which is called checkpoint modulators. So you're going to see a little bit more about that in a second. On the other end of, is, is what we call cell-based therapies, which is really fortifying and, and modifying in some ways your own immune system to be able to detect and attack cancer more effectively or effectively at all. You're going to hear a lot more about that at our UPenn, UPenn project. Uh, and then there's an emerging field of p possibilities for vaccines, uh, which I'm not an authority about, but another whole area of inquiry. And I might say at the outset, this is not what some of you, I think, uh, or I've heard patients sometimes confuse with viruses, oncolytic viruses, for instance. There's that one in Sweden that people have heard a lot about. We tested an oncolytic virus in one of our uh, projects uh, at Hopkins, actually, several years ago. Oncolytic viruses has been around a long time. We sure hope that there's success with uh, the virus that they're testing in Sweden. That's not immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is really about trying to figure out how we can get the immune system to recognize, attack, uh, and kill cancer cells. And there are two ways uh, we're going about that in our strategy. So our strategy is a multi-pronged effort. There's two major projects at two top centers. You heard a little bit about one here last year. Uh, but we also continue to reach out through the request for proposal process to find out what else is happening out there, subject that to our scientific review, bring in more immunological experts. We just added one to our scientific advisory committee. So we have the best minds thinking on your behalf in terms of where this research can go next. The two major projects are at Stanford University, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to talk to give it over to Dr. Metz uh, to talk about a very exciting project that we have at the University of Pennsylvania. There are those three additional grants that are really informing the work of those two projects and others, really kind of at the micro level looking at our tumors so we can figure out what it is that's unique about them that causes them to be able to evade the immune system. Where are their defenses and, quite frankly, where are their vulnerabilities that we might be able to exploit to successfully get the immune system to uh, attack them? Uh, and of course, a big part of my job is raising the money to fund that kind of research, as many of you know. Uh, but we got a huge boost in this one because the TripAdvisor uh, Foundation gave us a million dollars to really start our way on this $2 million project. So. Very quickly, I'm not sure I can click on this or you have to do that up there. Uh, the Stanford project is that first type and um, I have a video that won't be gross, I promise, uh, but I hope will uh, really help you with uh, understanding at least how one of these uh, approaches to immunotherapy works. So if you can turn the volume up and let's get it started. As a scientist, I specialize in cancer immunotherapy. My work, and that of my colleagues, is to figure out ways to stimulate the immune system to kill cancer. To understand this concept, let's talk a little more about our immune system and how it works. Taking a look inside our body, all of us are born with an immune system that acts like the security checkpoint at the airport. Our immune system is like a high-tech full-body scanner system that protects us from things that are harmful. In the immune system, T cells have receptors that scan cells to distinguish between normal cells and abnormal cells, like virus-infected cells. Once detected, abnormal cells are attacked and removed by T cells. T cells also identify these cells for future recognition. The same T cells also play an important role in protecting us from cancer. Cancer cells are normal cells that have mutated. The more mutations cancer cells have, the more easily they are detected. Until recently, we didn't understand why T cells were detecting these cancer cells, but not destroying them. But on a closer look, we've made some revealing discoveries. We've learned that one of the ways that cancer cells get past the security system is with the help of a molecule called PDL1 that is found on the surface of cancer cells. PDL1 is almost like a disguise that allows cancer cells to remain undetected. PDL1 basically hacks the T cell scanning system by jamming the signal to parts of the T cell system called PD1 and B7-1. 
Think of PD-1 as a sensor that's part of the T-cell scanning system. And B-7-1 is like an alarm that issues an alert when something is wrong. When PD-L1 hats the system, it prevents it from doing what it's supposed to do. In other words, it may prevent T-cells from destroying cancer cells. Scientists have been working on fixing this problem and have designed molecules to target the PD-L1, PD-1 pathway. You can think of cancer immunotherapy as kind of like a software update for your immune system. Early studies suggest that by targeting the PD-L1, PD-1 pathway, T-cells may be able to detect and destroy cancer cells. Let me show you in more detail. T-cells have receptors that allow them to recognize cancer. Cancer cells can prevent elimination by turning on PD-L1. PD-L1 deactivates T-cells by binding to PD-1 and B-7-1. Blocking PD-L1 from binding to PD-1 and B-7-1 could prevent PD-L1 from communicating with them. When this happens, T-cells may finally be able to respond and kill cancer cells. Clinical trials are currently underway to understand the effects of trying to block the PD-L1, PD-1 pathway in the body. We are committed to studying cancer immunotherapy so that we can continue to find new ways to harness the immune system to fight multiple types of cancer. Brought to you by Genentech, a member of the Roche Group. Sorry about the advertisement. This is a YouTube video that uh, that link will work if any of you want to look at that again. But uh, Genentech is actually providing the uh, um, the compound that's uh, being one of two being tested by our clinical trial. So let me give you a very quick overview of that. So this is the Stanford trial. When we were here last year, it was just being announced very shortly after. Uh, we are going to be opening this trial, uh, we believe, next month. Um, it's all about this checkpoint, uh, immunological checkpoint uh, tumor suppression that was just described in that short video. Uh, so far, this has been the method that has been most successful in working with especially melanoma patients, but also some leukemia, lung cancer, et cetera. Um, but there are some serious potential side effects, and so we are going to be very, very diligent in the, in the study design about measuring uh, and enrolling patients in very small groups, measuring the side effects, measuring the impacts on their neuroendocrine tumors very, very carefully so we can learn as much as we can and hopefully also see some uh, very positive results as well. So that's what this is all about, maximizing the potential, limiting the toxicities, and it's basically two different uh, uh, compounds that are being used, uh, one of which is uh, uh, the one that was described in, in the video. What I heard at the ASCO meetings, the clinical oncology, is that for a lot of patients, including melanoma patients, it's the combination. There are really two or three different pathways working here that are blocking the T cells. It's the combinations that work the best. We're also going to be uh, uh, um, giving this uh, set of compounds in phase, but also through injections within an individual tumor. And you say, well, if I have a lot of tumors, how's that going to help? In laboratory animals, there's often a systemic response when there's a good response to these things, even if it's in one tumor to other tumors and other sites. It's kind of amazing how the body, when it finally recognizes something, can actually reproduce that. So that's what they're doing. These are some of the eligibility criteria. So people ask about this. You, you heard about KI-67. It's going to be 10 pancreatic, 10 non-pancreatic. Uh, tumor grades uh, with KI-67 is under 55. That's a pretty broad range. Uh, ECOG performance status is really you know, ambulatory patients uh, for the most part. Uh, and prior treatment and tumor progression. So we can really measure the impacts of these, uh, these compounds. We are still anticipating to start uh, in the summer of 2015. Uh, and again, as Dr. Kuhn said uh, last year in response to this question, if anybody has an interest, talk to your doctor. That's really the best way to find out about this particular trial. We will post as soon as it is uh, ready to go. It will be on clinicaltrials.gov, but you can always come to our website and look at our clinical trials finder and get the information. Um, and, uh, and again, go through your oncologist if this is something that you think is possibly in of interest to you.